I really try to align duties um, based on each person's area of interest uh, or strength, something that they're passionate about. You know, if one of our recruiters um, is passionate about learning more about X, Y, Z, we'll start tiptoeing into that area and sharing, sharing some duties and, and cross training. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast focused on blending research and practical advice to help today's HR, talent and learning leaders improve business outcomes. Let's welcome your host, Ben Eubanks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Ben Eubanks, your host. And today we're going to talk about scaling an HR team with the business and aligning with the business and all those other good things. You know, one of the things that I think of uh, working in HR for a lot of my career is as the business grows, as the organization grows, obviously you're hiring a lot of people, but your HR team needs to grow as well, right? You got to support that and sustain that. And so we're going to talk about some of those things today, as well as how to align with the business, some of those key points that I keep hearing from audiences over and over again. Hey, we want to know how to be more strategic, how to get our, I hate to say it, see, see the table, but they want to understand how to align better with the things their business needs from them. And so I had a conversation recently with a, a longtime friend, and um, she was sharing some of the ideas and things that she's seen and, uh, and learned from and put into practice over her career. So I'm really excited to have her on the show today. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kelly Webb to the conversation. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Absolutely. So before we dive into this conversation, it's going to be a, a bunch of nerdy fun. I've already given the, <laughs> given the hints there. But um, tell us a little about who you are and what you do. Uh, certainly. Well, as you said, my name is Kelly Webb. Um, I've been in the HR field for about 20 plus years. Um, my current title is Vice President and CHRO for Cinecore Foundation. Um, Cinecore is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are focused in the behavioral health space. We um, have substance use disorder and mental health treatment facilities uh, throughout Texas and Louisiana. So we provide a, a full continuum of services, everything from detox to short-term inpatient, long-term inpatient, outpatient treatment, um, all of those for adults. And then we also do short-term inpatient and outpatient treatment for adolescents. Unfortunately, that's a need as well. So big mission for the company, obviously. You guys are doing really good work. And I think that's how we originally connected, too. Yes. In general, like the one of the, the roles that I had in HR years ago was working for a company that worked with those that had uh, either it was mental illness or mental health issues, things they needed some support on. And so I think that might be how we originally connected. I don't know for sure, but I'll just – we'll roll with it. We'll act like that's that's how it all connected in. Exactly. Oh, goodness. Um, so when you're not working – what does Kelly like to do? Uh, I actually uh, coach CrossFit on the side. Um, my husband and I were longtime runners and did half marathons with uh, another couple, and um, they got into CrossFit, and I said, I'm not doing that. Those people are crazy, and lo and behold, I transitioned to CrossFit, and we are crazy, um, and both my husband and I became coaches about three years ago, and so um, it really is just an extension of giving back and helping people just in a different way, but that's that's definitely something I'm passionate about outside of work. Awesome. Very cool. I'm not surprised to hear you threw yourself into something else with with passion, just like you do with with the day job. Um, that's that's kind of common when I'm talking to people that are in our space. They they have that mindset where I'm going to if I'm going to go in, I'm not going to dip my toe in. I'm going all in. You got it. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I've also said that you the cross hitters are crazy. But I, I also at the same time, I'm like, hmm, that seems kind of fun. I don't know. So <laughs> there may be a day where that becomes becomes part of the routine. Uh, but for now, for now, running is running is all I can fit in with all the other fun stuff going on. So. All right. So let's talk about scaling an HR team. So we recently had an interview for a research project, and you were telling me that in the last 10 years that you've been at Cinecor, the company has grown from 80 people to 500 plus. I don't know what the exact number is. You'll share it with us, I'm sure. But one of the things that wraps into that is that your HR team has obviously grown accordingly. You know, you don't need as many people for 80 as you do for 500. And so I want to talk about that process of deciding what to hire for, who to hire next, when to do that, some of those kind of nuts and bolts details of hiring and building an HR team as the company grows. Does that sound good to you? Absolutely. All right. So how big is Cinecore now? Uh, we are up to 535 employees um, on our way to uh, 575 by year end. Oh, wow. Woo. So you guys are coasting into the end of the year, I can tell. 
Oh, so let's talk a little about, so you're leading this HR team. Um, let's talk a little about the hiring piece of that because I want to know more about how you make decisions there. So talk about some of the, if you don't mind, if you can remember that far back, some of the early hires you made, maybe how those decisions were made. Was it like, hey, we need a generalist because I need to offload that so you can focus on other things? Is it we need a recruiter because that's a big part of the job and we need to define that? I'm kind of curious how you started making those decisions on who to hire. Absolutely. Yeah, going back to the very beginning, I was hired in uh, July of 2009. We were 82 employees. Um, we had three long-term facilities in our corporate office, and, and that was it. Um, but the good news was I knew from the interview process that we were going to be growing. My CEO shared that uh, basically during the first interview. Um, it, it's part of our strategic plan um, to grow and serve those communities where there's a need. Um, and so he said from the very beginning, he shared that vision, and I was on board. Um, unfortunately, when I joined in 2009, we had been without a director of HR for about three months. Um, they were using a temp for HR, HR clerical duties only. Um, so when I came in, it was a team of one. I transitioned those duties to me, um, jumped in, and I really wanted to focus on our processes and technology before I started thinking about staffing. Um, and 2009 was interesting. Um, we were using paper timesheets. Um, PTO was tracked in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, all prior benefits open enrollment had been done on paper. Um, the payroll system that we were using when I started was supposed to be used for single state, single location. And we were using in two states and four locations at the time. Uh, it was ugly. Um, now, all as far as our um, applicant tracking system, um, we had an email address, resumes at cinecore.org. Um, all candidates sent their resumes to me. I got to open them, review, and send each resume out to one of our three facilities, or maybe it was someone from corporate. Uh, corporate. So my very first request within my first two weeks was I need a full HRIS system. You've told me we're growing. You're told you tell me this is where we need to go. I need the full full Cadillac of a system. I need to automate timekeeping, PTO tracking, applicant tracking. Um, we had benefits open enrollment coming up on November 1st. Our plan year starts on November 1st. And I was adamant in July that we would have an electronic benefits open enrollment. Um, and we did. Um, and thankfully, uh, because of our projected growth, my CEO uh, bit off on that I need a Cadillac of a system um, because my selling point was if we get the right system in place, that's going to help me manage my headcount. All this manual work is, is adding nothing but time. Um, and so it was approved and we got to work um, vetting the payroll uh, vendors. And we did that in implementation by October and we barely made it. Um, but we had electronic uh, open enrollment for the first time in 2009. Um, and so kind of after that big push to get that done, um, I went back kind of to my early uh, HR days. I used to do HR consulting in my 20s, um, and I started at the very beginning of that HR life cycle. What do we have? What do we need? What needs to be implemented? What needs to be improved? We didn't have new hire orientation. Job descriptions were lacking. Um, so there was there was a lot to do. And during that first six months, um, I made the decision that, yes, I am still going to have some of those clerical things, even with this new system, um, and need some support. And so we posted for an HR assistant um, within six months after joining. Um, and the person that we hired, uh, B. Lytle, she is now my HR manager. Um, and I'm happy to say she's basically been my partner in crime for the last nine and a half years. Uh, she does a, does a phenomenal job. She came to us with a lot of experience. But if you remember in 2009, that was a downturn um, for in a lot of areas, including Houston. Um, and so B came to us thinking, you know, I don't know what this crazy nonprofit is, but I'm going to take the position. Um, and, and she really latched on to our mission. Um, and she grew into a full time generalist position in just a matter of a few months um, in 2010. Um, and so fast forward a little bit. We did some smaller acquisitions in 2011, 2012, um, again, with nonprofits and the way healthcare funding and, and behavioral health funding has changed and continues to change, um, a lot of the smaller nonprofits are just not able to make it. Um, and so we've had to go into some communities and, you know, sometimes we've had to write $300,000 checks to bail out um, and, and keep these services going in, in a community. Um, 
But by doing that, we were able to continue those services. And so we made some um, smaller um, jumps at that point. Um, but by mid-2013, we had increased to six locations with about 200 employees. Um, and because of that increase, that, of course, increased our employee relations, more of the clerical duties. Um, and so we hired a full-time assistant in early 2014. Um, and so at that point, you know, B was handling employee relations. We hired this assistant to help with more clinical, uh, the clerical, um, and we kept rolling. And then by 2016, we added another two locations um, and we decided in order to, number one, better standardize our hiring um, and get, get a handle on hiring and recruiting um, and also be able to provide additional support to our facility leadership that we were going to centralize management of our uh, selection process and the flow of candidates to our corporate office. And we added two recruiters to the team. And really, we, we were able to get buy in on that. Our, our uh, management team, as you can imagine, being out in the facility and managing clients and patients who are detoxing and, and, and going through some of these processes, um, they're not, you know, sitting at their desk like a lot of um, other standard jobs. And so, you know, they're not always there to do phone screens or return um, reference calls and things like that. So we centralize that piece of it. And the main thing that they do is the face to face interviews. So that's how we decided to add the recruiters. Um, and then we got to. Um, 2017, when we were up to about 400 employees, um, we in, ended up um, implementing what we call our Big Five Performance Management System, and that is all of our team members, regardless if it is you know, a frontline staff, a management staff, an executive team member, we complete a short self-report on our top five priorities every 60 days and then come back around and report on those completed priorities at the end of 60 days. So it's this ongoing performance management system. So by the time you get to your end of year for annual performance review, you have six data points of what were the priorities you completed for that year. And so we implemented that system in 2017. Um, we were up to 400 employees. And so we hired uh, what we call a performance management administrator. And so he supports that that system of performance management. And he's actually located um, at one of our Houston facilities. And so he manages that system, some of our training functions. And then he also supports um, employee relations for two of our Houston facilities just because of proximity. Um, and then last but not least, in uh, late 2018, early 2019, we acquired two additional nonprofits. Um, one of those nonprofits had a location of 100 employees, uh, so we had a big jump in late 2018. Um, fortunately, they had a superstar HR specialist uh, there on staff, and so because HR was rolled up as a function to corporate now, a lot of her job duties were being incorporated into our systems. Um, but we had a need for, at this point, an employee relations specialist, and so she transitioned over to that role. Um, and she is actually serving multiple locations um, other than corporate in the Houston locations where, that we still service here. Um, and then I guess last but not least, as far as, you know, breaking out job responsibilities and figuring out who's doing what. And it, it, I'm a big believer in strengths based leadership. Um, and so as we've grown, I've always been very focused on trying to align duties. Um, and change job descriptions as needed, um, depending on who the team members are. And I know that's going to make raise some eyebrows uh, for some people, but I really try to align duties um, based on each person's area of interest uh, or strength, something that they're passionate about. You know, if one of our recruiters um, is passionate about learning more about X, Y, Z, we'll start tiptoeing into that area and sharing, sharing some duties and, and cross training. Um, and then my HR generalist is, has been phenomenal. She's about to have her five year anniversary as well. And so, um, I, I think it just really, um, is a satisfier for the HR team members when you're focused on not only what needs to get done, um, but what they're passionate about and where they would like to grow as well. And then cultivating that. We are not exempt from that being an HR, right? It, it seems like sometimes the, the HR team's the last one to get any attention or any focus or any support for development, things like that. But it sounds like that's been a priority for you from day one. Hearing um, B, right, that's her name, um, hearing her grow from grow up with the function as the business grows and expands, 
the opportunities for her are have been almost limitless for her to expand and, and learn new things and go to areas probably where she loves. She has a passion for some of those words you were using a minute ago, right? She's an interest, a strength, or a passion in that area, and she can focus on those. I think it's really an interesting approach. And I, one of the other things that kind of stuck out to me is the fact that you have someone that is focusing on the performance management piece um, kind of dedicated there because usually that, that just kind of falls under under another type of HR generalist. Someone else is going to do that. But I love that you've kind of pinpointed that that person is responsible, not just for that, but, but for kind of overseeing the process, make sure you get the most out of it. Um, some interesting nuances to how you've approached this, uh, which I think everybody can learn a few lessons from for sure. Awesome. Thank you. So one of the things you mentioned a couple of times, <laughs> a couple of times is, uh, or were the acquisitions. Those have happened fairly regularly. Um, yes. How do you approach one of those from, from a people perspective, right? You're thinking about, you mentioned some examples, right? We have a oh, hundred new people in this location. We're going to support those people, but how are you thinking about that from a maybe a culture or how do you assimilate them into the, the fold? Um, do they retain their own kind of local culture and way of doing things? Do they do you put all your processes in place over them? I'm kind of curious about how that piece of the puzzle fits in because I know even comes to do that one time, it can cripple them for a while if they don't do it right. And it sounds like you – uh, Cinecore has been on a steady stream of those over the last 10 years. Absolutely. Um, the first ones were a couple bumpy. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, there were some lessons learned um, early on for sure. Um, but one of the things, again, that um, that I will say is we, we have a very strong view of our culture. Um, we know what is important to us and we actually have what's called a culture survey. Um, and all of our managers, directors, executives, all the way up to our CEO get rated on five questions, um, as to how they're upholding the culture. Um, and that is tied back to 20% of their annual bonus. Um, and so we are very serious about our culture and the questions are things like, you know, does this person, um, consistently make decisions that are in alignment with our mission, support our mission? You know, does this person demonstrate positive, respectful communication? Um, does this person, is this person an effective team member? Um, and so it's, it's not rocket science. If you're, you know, if you're remotely a good leader, you're going to get this 20% of your bonus. We're not out to ding people um, and take away money. Uh, what we are about is trying to figure out if we have issues um, and then helping that person, giving them some opportunities for development, um, maybe some communications training, whatever it might be, wherever that gap is. Um, and then knowing that you're going to be rated by your peers, your supervisor and your direct reports anonymously every six months. And that's tied into bonus. Uh, people get a little more focused on whether or not they're upholding the culture. Um, and we actually started that culture survey after our second acquisition, like I said, which is a little more bumpy. But um, and I will tell you, out of every acquisition um, that we've done, there's probably been two to three other organizations that we have looked at and we have not moved forward with because it was not a culture fit. And that is that is to me, that is a critical point. Um, it, we have a, we do a lot of due diligence going in now. You, we've got lengthy worksheets on all the due diligence items that we have, and HR is a big piece of that. And if we go in and we interview, and we, we're working with the leadership team, and we go in, in and we interview some of the frontline staff members, and if we feel overall it's not going to be a good culture fit, we walk away. We walk away, and that to me has been critical because there have been quite a few. Uh, Cinecore is a, a nonprofit that runs like a for profit. We like to say we are. Uh, 51% mission and 49% business. And so we're, we're not going to, we're not going to carry um, an, an organization that is not willing to be focused on the mission, but also be focused on the numbers. Cause that's how we've been in business for the last 53 years and how we'll be in business for another 53 years. And so that's something that that's very critical to us when we're looking at uh, acquisitions. I love that. Well, I've used this, the, the phrase a lot of times because I heard it years ago and it has stuck with me so long, but uh, I heard someone once say, you don't, you don't build a great place to Goodness, you don't build a great place to work. You defend it. You you, know, you create this great thing, and then you keep all the other bad stuff out. And I, during one of the recent recent episodes, um, I got to to hear from the number one mid sized employer in the United States. Their their HR team sits here in Huntsville, where I am, and 
the VP of HR was saying um, that their motto is, if you don't want a bad employee, don't hire them. <laughs> that's that's what I'm hearing because I'm sure you talk about this is HR, and that, I think that's important as a distinction. You have that that vote, you have that walkway power where you're not sold out completely on oh well this this might be profitable but long term it's not going to be if we have to all this turnover or it impacts everything else in the business negatively from from a people perspective so I think that's a powerful piece of the puzzle and actually a great transition because I have another question I want to ask you about another another thing we talked about before one of the things I'm going to quote you back to yourself um, because I thought it was very profound you said at Cinecore organizational health is just as valuable as financial health. Right? How how the people side operates is just as valuable as how the, the financials run, the books and the budgets and everything else, because they are deeply linked, I would say. Um, so one of the, the question I guess I had for you was, do you think HR can be successful if they're working for a team, work for a leadership team, work for a company that doesn't actually value HR or the people side of the business? Is that possible? Um, I, that can definitely make it more difficult for sure. <laughs> um, if, if you're working with a leadership team that doesn't value that. Um, but I, I truly believe it's it's up to us as HR leaders um, to to help those who don't necessarily value the people side of the business or and put it in terms they can understand, you know, meaning if, if they're focused on operations, how do we frame this up around operations? If they're focused on the numbers, how do you how do you figure out where where their value is? And if you need to sell something, what is the outcome or return on investment or what what do you need to show them to make it worthwhile for them? And it may be different for different people. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that with my CEO, he is absolutely a numbers guy, um, but he also sees the value in HR. Um, you know, our clients, our patients, our residents come first, but our team members are the next level of our mission. We have approximately. And so for us, I think it's a little bit easier to see that connection because approximately 70 percent of all of our team members are also in recovery. And so it truly is an extension of our mission to support our team members to success as well. And when you care for them and you show true care and concern for them as individuals and give them opportunities and, and show them career paths and leadership development, they know you're invested in them. They will turn back around and invest in their job. Um, and, and for us, they turn back around and invest in our patients and our clients. Um, and we do little things. Uh, I say little things, but it can be a big thing. You know, nonprofits are historically known for, you know, you don't go in and make millions. Um, and we know we have some frontline staff that may struggle. And so we do things like advance on wages and things like that. So we don't have employees um, going and doing, you know, expensive payday loans and things that it, you have to dig out of that hole. And so um, it's 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 little things, but it adds up to big things. When you can get your leadership team um, to buy in and understand investing in them is truly investing in the business. I think that message is well heard in other areas, other other industries. But again, based on my experience working in the nonprofit world and just seeing some of the, the, the companies that are in that space, it's almost like they, they say, hey, the mission is so important that we expect you to just give up having a good work environment or give up having respect in the workplace. Like you're just going to grind yourself into a pulp in order to serve this mission when long-term that creates negative impacts on the community, on their family, everything else. So I love hearing you say, it's not just about serving, serving the mission in terms of outward, right? The patients, the, the clients, the people that need your support and the reason you're, your employees get up every morning with a smile on their face because they get to go in and serve those people and serve them well because they know them. As you said, uh, a chunk of them are in recovery themselves. I think that's very important. But at the same time, those employees are also, because they're being treated well, because they have an HR team that's looking out for them and, and trying to trying to support them with with whatever process or tool or you know even a just, just a, an ear when they need it, right? Um, giving them those things helps them to not have to trade off like, okay, I'm just going to give up on supporting my family or caring about them or being able to support them as well because I, my job is grinding me, grinding me into dust basically. So that's a big generalization and I'm I hopefully don't make me mad for that, but that's just what I've seen in my own experience. And it, it hurts to see that. Yes. And, and you're absolutely right. And I, I have to be very honest. It took me volunteering and working at a couple of nonprofits to find the right one because it was exactly that it was so focused 
on the mission, which, of course, you have to be, that everything else was, I would say, almost ignored, including the employees. And that just creates, you know, burnout. And um, you have people that come in that are so passionate about the mission um, and then you burn them up and, and, and you know, they're burnt on that um, on that industry and they go do something else or they go to another organization. The Cinecor is the first nonprofit that I found that has that balance. Um, you know, it's, it's just like, um, you know, if we have, uh, uh, let's say we have 30 clients in our residential treatment facility. If you have one client that is impacting the safety of the other clients, you have no choice but to refer them out. They have no choice but to leave because they're breaking cardinal rules like making threats or things like that. So it's the safety of the entire group, even if it's at the, the, um, risk of that one client being turned away, unfortunately, that's the situation that we're in. And where other nonprofits would put them, so would, would try and keep every single client, even those um, who are above the level of care that we're trying to give or um, who are not behaving in a way that are safe, not only for the other clients, but for the employees as well. And so I believe Cinecor does a great job of trying to create that strong, positive environment, not only for our clients, but for our employees as well. Um, and that's why we've had so many long-term employees and we've had employees um, that have worked for us, gone somewhere else, and then come back to work for us. That is that is a, a recurring theme for us. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm happy when people get other positions and go on to do other things. My job is just to help develop and promote and get them to the best that they're going to be wherever they end up. I hope it's with Cinecor, but I feel like by pouring into every single team member, best case scenario, they stay with us and, and shoot up and continue to grow up into a leadership position. Um, worst case scenario, they take that somewhere else, but they're still going to impact other people in their community. Um, and that to me is what it's all about. I have about. To say, such a mature view of the world. I love that. Uh, it's not easy like to help someone grow and then they, and then they eventually take off. But I, I was telling someone the other day, I, I actually ran across an organization that is based in uh, Colorado. They were, they started up, they had all these people come in and they would leave after a year or two of experience with them and go start their own company. And so they were upset at first, like how do we create some sort of benefit or some kind of process? How do we hold them in like golden handcuffs so they'll stay here? And then they realized, well, no, because then they're just going to stick around because they feel like they have to instead of because they want to. So they, they kind of rebranded their recruiting to, to come here and we'll teach you how to go, go be great somewhere else. Right. If you want to be great here, that's fine. But if you want to be great somewhere else, we will help you do that. It sounds like a similar kind of vision, right? If ideally you'll stick around, you'll contribute here. But if you don't, that's okay. We know that we're going to help you be successful long term, regardless of where you end up. Right. I think I saw a quote the other day and it was so true. It said something to the effect of, you know, it's a little cartoon with two people talking and the one guy is saying, you know, well, what if we what if we give them all this training and, and they leave and they go somewhere else? And the second guy was saying, well, what if we don't give them the training and they stay here? I mean, what if we you know, um, you, again, I, it only betters the mission if we better our team members. Um, and that's what we're really focused on. Goodness. Wow. There's been so many good takeaways from this one. I've been I've been taking my notes over here and and listing all these ideas and everything else. It's been so fun for me because, again, you and I had a conversation um, just a few weeks ago. And even now, I'm still picking up other new ideas and everything else. I just... I admire the work you're doing. Obviously, the mission is a, is a powerful one, but you, with the work that you and your team are doing, is enabling them to serve serve more people in a better way, in a more positive way. So just kudos to you and the rest of the crew. Give everybody a hug. Tell them this from Ben. It's okay. Um, and uh, goodness gracious. So I want to be respectful of your time. So if someone wants to just learn more about the work that Cinecor is doing or if they want to connect with, connect with you because they just respect the work you're doing, What's the best way to do that? Um, well, they can certainly link up with me on LinkedIn, Kelly Webb on LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Purposeful HR, um, or they can email me, kweb at cinecore.org, and our website is cinecore.org. Awesome. I'll make sure and get those links in the show notes so they can connect with you and learn more or uh, connect to Cinecore. They'd like to do that as well. So I, I would not doubt that some people listening here might be in some of the areas you're actually serving in, right, in the, in the Texas area. So that's really cool. 
Wow. Thank you so much for joining, Kelly. This has been really, really great. All right. Thank you, Ben. I enjoyed it. To everybody else, I hope you had as much fun as I did. This has been just a great conversation. Lots of good takeaways from Kelly. She's obviously passionate, you can tell, but also an amazing business professional. And guess what? She just happens to practice HR. I love it. To everybody else, I hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening to We're Only Human. Please take a moment to share this episode with another HR leader who might see it as a valuable resource in their daily work. For more information about the podcast and to see all our show archives, please visit upstarthr.com.